Hi, everyone. <laughs> I am Catherine Castellino. Um, I've been in the book design world for over 16 years now. This is me. Uh, I did 13 and a half years working in-house, going from intern, junior designer, designer, senior designer, art director, senior art director, so I've run the whole uh, race with that. In 2016, I decided to open my own design studio, and I'm currently starting year four of running my company full time. Um, for all those visual, visual folks in the audience, uh, here's a handy timeline of my career. <laughs> Um, when Ann and Nicole asked me to talk about my process tonight, I decided what might be most interesting to everyone here is kind of my wider creative process as it's evolved over my career because it's changed a lot. So here's the first six years of my career, six or so years, and uh, during that time, uh, the process I was most interested and invested in was the design process. Um, it was what those of you who have been designers in-house would expect. It was strictly design. You know, the new list comes in, your AD assigns you titles, you design those titles. Um, essentially, you have an inbox where assignments and cohesive briefs magically appear. Um, during this time, when I worked with Rodrigo and at Simon & Schuster and Random House, you know, these are some of the covers I got. I got some great books to work on, um, you know, Picador is on the left. That's a Simon & Schuster cover. That was a freelance cover, actually, um, the Our Daily Meds. Um, Arvine Welsh was something I did working at Rodrigo's studio. And The Worst Years is something I did at Simon & Schuster. So I was getting, you know, these one-off assignments. Um, and, you know, what you're doing is you're taking each at bat, and you're really focusing on hitting one ball out of the park. Like, you're working on your craft. You're getting faster. And 99% of what you're doing is design. Um, I don't remember ever presenting covers like at any of those first few jobs. Um, I really never left the art department. <laughs> you know, I just stayed in those in my office or those rooms. I talked with the art directors, I talked with the designers, but I didn't. You know, the bigger publishing house was kind of a mystery to me. So once I got beyond those first six or so years, uh, I noticed the process started to change. Essentially, it went from being when I was a senior designer at Random House to when I went to Grand, Grand Central Publishing as an art director. I started at GCP in 2009, uh, art directing the 12 list under Ann Toomey, who is my creative director, who you all know. And uh, my creative process gradually started to change when I was um, the six years that I was at this job. This is one of the very first projects I did when I started at Grand Central. And I like to show this cover a lot because I love it and it's beautiful, but it's also really an interesting design process. Um, but when I share it with students and at talks, someone always asks me, what other things did you show? And the truth is, I only show this one design. And then people look at me like I'm nuts. <laughs> uh, for those of you who aren't in book design, you know, the way it works is you're probably showing five to ten unique designs on the first round, and you're probably going three rounds at least, tweaking things, pursuing different ideas, um, you know, all different kinds of directions. So I want to draw back the curtain on how I did just one design here and talk about the bigger process. Because I didn't just walk into a meeting like, ta-da, there's the winning cover. Um, it's a, there was a lot more to it than that. So let me rewind um, a little on this book. The first time I heard about it was during launch meeting. And that's where editors introduce the books they've bought to the rest of the publishing team. This is the first time everyone's hearing about a book. It's a starting pistol. Um, in my previous jobs when I was at the designer level, I didn't go to launch. Uh, so during launch, I got to hear the editor, Jamie Levine, talk about this book and speak directly about why she bought it and why she wanted to publish it, why it was cool. Um, and I got to hear not only her talk about it, but everyone else on the table ask questions, you know, the salespeople, the marketing people. So you really got a picture of what this project was, not just from a tip sheet, but like people talking passionately about what was there. Um, it sounded like a really interesting book. And so I specifically asked Anne, my creative director, if I could work on it. Um, I read the manuscript, and then I sat down with the editor, and we talked. Um, 
And, and I told Anne about my idea for the cover. And as I was working on it, there's a scene in the book where there's these shadow puppets and they start moving um, without anyone controlling them. And you realize that there's a lot of magic in this book and it's a very kind of Gotham-esque city and crazy magic, dark magic is happening. So I had this and I, I think I showed Anne um, this image and I had these little letters and I was like, I think I'm going to make shadow puppets out of the letters. I started kind of shooting stuff in my studio at home and I showed these to Anne and she was like oh I actually have one of these amazing shadow puppets um from I think I think your sister had bought it for you when she was traveling <laughs> and I, and so I was like this is great so I ended up setting up the whole process like that and that's all like with a clothing rack and a sheet and my studio <laughs> and everything was done in camera so that's the final cover and that's the jacket with the wrap. You know, yes, I showed one comp, but this was probably the result of 40 hours of work. You know, and what made this process different was that communication and collaboration became more important to everyone than, creative, than creating tons of cover options. Let me repeat that, because I think this is really important. What made this process different was that communication and collaboration became more important to everyone than creating tons of cover options. All those hours talking with the editor got her excited, and she shared my concept with the author even before it was designed, and he got excited. You know, I had buy-in from everyone. I'd shared it with my creative director, and all everybody had helped me sharpen my concept and the idea. Once I realized this process worked, like you hit a homer out of the park, and you're like, oh, maybe I can do one cover for every book. <laughs> um, so I kind of started adopting this process for everything that I was overseeing. And here are some of the books I did while I was the art director for 12. And some of these I've designed, and some of them um, I art directed. But more often than not, my covers there were also one and done, kind of approved on the first round or approved with the first concept. You know, a lot of them, like some of the ones with the complex lettering, we saw different sketches of lettering. We kind of honed in on things. But I never pursued other directions. Like, I brought these directions to my publisher. Um, and said, this is what I'm thinking, and we got approval and buy-in really early on. So, and these are a few covers I did for the GCP list, because I was also, even though I was the art director for 12, I was working on Grand Central too. And again, these are all one and done. Like, you know, the City of Snakes I illustrated, showed the concept, you know, I was kind of pitching like a very Banksy-esque street art for that one. The other one was illustration the photo shoot I pitched, and, and a lot of these, because the process was so intense, you know, you can't pursue more than one direction. You really have to go all in with this kind of stuff, especially like the one on the right, you know, I hired an illustrator and a photographer and a set designer. So there was a lot of people involved. Albert of Adelaide was another cover where we only did one thing. Uh, but again, I heard about this book when it was first bought. Like, my publisher told me, I've got this cool book. It's like Cormac McCarthy. There's animal characters. It's totally crazy. And so I said, sounds like Watership Down, like adult themes with animals. And I have the perfect illustrator in mind for this, Mark Burkhart. And so I showed these things to him. And he was like, go, let's see. And when we started going through it, like we were just kind of going in the straight direction. Like our debates were like whether or not Albert has clothes. <laughs> on the top he has clothes, on the bottom he doesn't. Like so these are the kind of things we're just like honing in on something. We're not trying a million things. And then this is my like vellum over the illustration with the lettering sketch, and that's the final lettering that I did in Illustrator. And then that's the whole jacket. I really like to do wraps, too, if you haven't noticed. I like to, it's a lot of space. It's kind of fun. So like the collaborative spirit and trust was what made that process really enjoyable, but also like successful and efficient. Like We really were able to get things approved that were special and had um, an involved process. Um, near the end of my time at GCP, I got pulled into another project by our publisher, Jamie Rabb. She told me they were bidding on a photography book, which was kind of out of our wheelhouse at um, GCP. Mostly we're doing like fiction and nonfiction. And she said it was with a big star and would I like to come to the initial meeting? Um, and this meeting was, we hadn't even gotten the book yet. So 
it's a stage where like multiple publishing houses are fighting over these books and about who's going to publish it. So they're trying to acquire the same project. And I said, yes, I was like, yeah, oh my God, photography book. Like this sounds amazing. It's a big star. Great. Um, and then she told me who the author was, uh, Lady Gaga. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, yes, yes, yes. So um, then on the day of the meeting, we took a cab downtown to meet with the photographer who is kind of like the co-author of the project. And when we walked in, I found myself uh, shaking hands with this guy, Terry Richardson, who's like the highest paid fashion photographer. I mean, he's just massive. So and I don't think we I don't think anyone said his name before we walked into the meeting, but he's like super recognizable. <laughs> so I saw him and was like, oh, yeah, OK, I know who you are. So, yeah, Terry. <laughs> so the biggest pop star in the world and the world's like highest paying fashion photographer were teaming up. And I was like, oh, my God, I need to work on this book. So after the initial meeting, um, Jamie asked me to come up with visual sketches to sweeten the offer because they're still trying to get this book at this point. And I, I pulled together these sketches like overnight. And... Um, and this was the first time I was really involved with like the what is it of the project, which was really interesting. And it's kind of a discussion that happens a lot of the time before the designer gets involved. And I loved that. I love that they didn't know what this book was going to be. Um, we really didn't know anything about the project other than it was Lady Gaga and Terry Richardson. And we needed a book in six months <laughs> in time for the holidays, which is like a massive, massive crash if you're doing an art book. So we got the book, and uh, because it was like 99% visual, I, I was not just dealing with the design, but with the logistics of the project. This is what the final ended up looking like. Um, it's like a, I think it's here, I brought it. But I was like, I was in Terry's studio on a weekly basis. I was like sitting with his retoucher, designers. We were looking at paper. Um, we were in meetings with Gaga's manager and lawyers because there were people and like pictures of crowds and there was all this logistical stuff that we dealt with. We even talked about page count because how heavy the book is depends how many books you can put in a box. Um, and because the book was massive, like if you're a union, you can't lift a box that's a certain amount of weight. So the, all these things were being talked about. And my involvement in the project was really like probably 10% actual graphic design. Like everything else was collaborating and problem solving and figuring out like what this book was going to be, um, how we were going to produce it in the timeline that we had, you know, coming up with like this visual narrative and all of the people that were involved. Like when you have two big stars, there's a lot of logistics. And I really love that what, like what are we doing here? Why are we making this book? And um, while the final book is really beautiful, what I'm most proud of was the process. Like, it was a real feat to pull it off. Even, like, with the cover, like, I convinced them not to put a title on the front. I just said, like, this is a Terry Richardson photo. He, like, shoots people with bright light against a white wall. I'm like, it says Gaga on her jacket. We're not putting type on it. And they were like, okay. But <laughs> it was, you know, it was a lot of kind of problem solving and figuring out things. When I started my own design studio in 2016, it was... Uh, important to me not just to be working as a designer, but what I wanted to do is work with clients um, who are at that very early stage of what is it. So I wanted to partner with people and help them figure out not just the visuals, but kind of like, why are you making this project? Um, and, you know, what are you doing with it? One of the clients that I've worked with a lot since opening my own studio is this company called Epic Media. It's a really cool company. Like, they're very focused on storytelling. And um, sometimes their work is like interactive websites. Like they did this really cool kind of website with video content for Google. They do videos, they do books, they do magazines. It's, it's all about storytelling in visual ways. So the first project we did together was for A&E. A&E came to Epic and they were like, we want to do something to show like all the programming that A&E has. And like from the TOC, you can see like A&E has all these networks that I didn't know were, you know, under the same umbrella. So like Viceland, um, Showtime, Showtime or Lifetime, um, History Channel, you know, all of these are kind of under the same umbrella and they're all the shows are really different. But they wanted to say like, hey, we have all this stuff. We have this really cool viewership. Um, how can we highlight that? And so when we started working together, the content of the book was really just taking shape. 
so we were able to talk about the direction of the content and the visual direction simultaneously, which was really, really fun. And we discovered like through this developing that people didn't know these shows were all under the same umbrella. They didn't know who the viewership was. So we wanted to change like change that and like highlight the diversity of the people and the viewership and, and it wanted it to be fun and about television. So Epic had started interviewing fans of different shows and they were like, there's so many cool people who watch these shows are like obsessed with, you know, whatever the show is. So they wanted to highlight these people. And um, we decided like, let's do portraits of these people to accompany these stories. I brought in an illustrator, Jared Oriel, for the art and he has like this just great modern fun style. He's really awesome. He works at Norton um, as a designer and book person. And uh, we started working on the book and then we realized that like we couldn't just do portraits because that would kind of get monotonous. So we also, he did these spot illustrations like on the, on the right hand corner, like you can see like some of them are spots, some of them are portraits. And then we also did infographics like, that I did, um, the timeline, the map and that kind of stuff. So we're really like, as we started to get this content coming in and drips and drabs, figuring out what the book looked like. The process was really fast and a lot of twists and turns. So, and, and initially we were gonna print digitally, but then A&E wanted like 5,000 copies. So <laughs> we realized, okay, we can't print digitally. We have to do this offset. So I also oversaw that entire process of like finding a domestic printer who could get this done in a short amount of time. And then since A&E, I've also worked on other projects with Epic ranging from uh, web design, pitch decks, books, and this is a book we did with I, uh, IBM. They had a new supercomputer and they wanted to do this very Lux limited edition for people who had worked on it. And this was like even more complex than A&E because we had two photographers that we commissioned for two location-based photo shoots. I hired uh, illustrator Leif Parsons to do spot illustrations and then I had Liz Saramer doing research. So this was just like a monster beast of a project. Because this big oversized book was leather, hand bound in leather, I was like literally looking at cowhide samples. Like we had to, we had to figure out how many cowhides would equal the you know number of books we needed to do, and, and order them, and pick the color, and all that kind of stuff. So that was really crazy. One of the benefits of running my own studio is that I can really dive deep on the process of certain projects. Um, in 2017, my husband Chris Sergio and I chaired the TDC's annual competition. And these aren't my designs, these are done by Triborough, who we hired to um, do the design for all of the campaign. I think they asked Chris because he was new on the board and he didn't know how much work it entailed. Uh, it was an 18 month process, probably the longest project I've ever been involved in. It starts with selecting the judges, hiring the design team, which I said is Triborough, and we even came up with like messaging for the campaign, like join the club, type design builds characters, you know, coming up with ways to uh, attract people. We had like send your work around the world, all these kind of things that Chris and I developed for the campaign. Um, we oversaw the website design, judging weekend, um, the opening, uh, all that kind of stuff. So um, this is the judging weekend. And so this is totally like not really designed, but you're designing, you're producing and designing an event, which is really cool. And then like the printed annual, like at the end of it, like when we took on this project, we we're like, oh, this will be great. We know how to do books. It'll be easy. But it was like 99% not book. <laughs> um, but then at the end, we did the book, uh, which, you know, was also a really cool process to oversee in terms of deciding like the materials and working with the designer to get everything the way they want it to look. Um, and I really, like, as I said, I didn't really do any graphic design here, but like the process and the result was so creatively gratifying. You know, we produced something that hundreds of people were involved in, like tons of people entered, tons of people went to the opening, it traveled around the world. Like, you know, it was just a really cool thing to have said that we produced. And if you have the opportunity or want to get involved, like plug for the TDC, like it's really a cool thing to see the behind the scenes there. And of course, as I've been taking on these like larger, more time consuming and intensive processes, I've still been doing a lot of covers. But even on these, I feel like my process has expanded a bit and gotten a little more focused in terms of the direction I choose when I'm working on stuff. Um, 
The two on the outside are for Norton, the one in the middle is for Penguin. The two on the left are for uh, Columbia University and the one on the right is for Houghton Mifflin. And then um, Grand Central Publishing, Houghton Mifflin, and uh, University of Pittsburgh. So like, as you can see, I have a really wide range of the kind of stuff I work on, fiction, nonfiction, um, big press, small press, and just all kinds of um, different techniques. Because I feel like every book is so different that I really kind of have to pick something. Um, the last project I want to share with you is a book cover, but you know, kind of a bit beyond the typical process. Um, it, it was one of those dream projects. I was approached by this publisher named Paul Suntup, who runs a publishing company that does these like super luxe editions. Like the pages, every page is letterpress, so that gives you an idea of how um, expensive and and you know beautiful these things are like hand marbled paper, leather bound, really, really cool. Um, this company's called Suntup Editions. If you are a collector or know a collector, <laughs> they're really cool. Um, so one of the authors he works with regularly is Stephen King. Uh, um, <laughs> so uh, when I first spoke to Paul, uh, he didn't have permission to publish uh, Misery. He was trying to get it. So like his process involves creating like this huge in-depth uh, presentation all at his own expense and then he shares it with Stephen King and Stephen King either says okay or he says no um, so he was really like throwing a lot of money at this throwing a lot of time and process um, and basically he called me up and he just said I just want you to think outside the box like I'm giving you the green light to do whatever you want um, come up with some cool stuff so so and we didn't even know he was doing multiple editions so we didn't know what edition we were going to eventually use stuff on. Um, but here's some of my process. This is a really cool book. If you haven't seen the movie or read it, like, please. <laughs> it's really, really cool. There's all these beautiful, awesome visuals. There's typewriters. There's burned paper. There's blood. You know, it's typical horror Stephen King. Um, I bought these typewriter keys on eBay. I photographed them. I also pitched this idea of making it a mattress and bed sheets because he's chained, stuck in bed. Um, the whole, the main character is stuck in bed like the whole time. So, you know, and after exploring like production options, like we were trying to do a mat, the whole thing would be a mattress. And then like you open it up and like there's like, bl like bloody sheets. We had this whole great thing. But like some of the production, we were just not able to um, figure out how to make it happen. But we finally landed on using typewriter hammers. And this is like, you can see my studio in Chinatown out the window. That place is really good for pho. <laughs> um, but so there's a, you know, I had these typewriter keys and that's my camera set up in the window, natural light. And I decided that I wanted to kind of play with the hammers because they could, I think they have this monolithic quality when you photograph them with, you know, a macro lens. So these are like test shots. The left shot's a test shot. So I was like, how you know, am I getting like this really detailed grit on the keys? And they, they were really beautiful. And of course, the keys are backwards because um, they make the impression on the paper. So that's the, the final shot, actually. And then that's when I Photoshopped it. So I put honey on there to make it look like blood. That's a little pro tip for anybody doing uh, still life photography. And then I just colorized it. So it's got that nice kind of thick, bloody color. But that was just such a fun project in terms of the, the blank check that I was given. Um, and you know, so whether I'm working on covers or, or these longer lead projects, I feel like it has become more of a you know, point my nose at something specific and, and kind of go for it. And then I'm also currently working on another project with him, which I'm really excited about, but I can't talk about yet. So, um, and happily, like, the brief on that is the same. It's, like, this very open-ended, like, what do you think it should be? And that's really where I love to start my process is questioning and exploring and thinking about, you know, what's the reason we're doing this? So that's the final book. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody.
everybody. <laughs> I'm Cassie Gonzalez. I'm an associate designer at Macmillan Children's for the imprints FSG and Roaring Book Press. I am very early in my career. I've been working for three years, um, two, almost two years at Macmillan, and then for a year before that, I was at Little Brown Books for Young Readers. Um, so here's me. <laughs> um, first and foremost, I've always been a reader. I love reading books. Um, I read every single book that I design from cover to, well, not cover to cover, because they don't come with covers when I get them, but I read every single book from beginning to end. You can ask my editors. Um, my mom is a teacher, and she taught me from a very young age the importance of reading and having yourself reflected mm -hmm. in the books that you read. Um, you can see in this little book over here, I'm reading a book called Cassie's Book About Cassie. <laughs> Um, another fun fact about me is that I'm a legitimate speed reader. Um, I read three times as fast as the average, but I still retain all the information. So that really helps me with the whole reading every single book uh, that I work on. Um, so these first three pictures are my very overstuffed apartment, which my roommates have banned me from buying any more books until I give some away. Um, and then the last photo is my little bookshelf at work um, with most of the books that I've designed. Um, so here are some of my covers. Uh, not all of them. I work on about 45 books at a time, which is a lot to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I will work on mostly middle grade and young adult novels. So middle grade is usually between the ages of 8 to 12, and then young adult is somewhere in the range of 12 or 13 um, to 18. Um, Content-wise, I really love that um, my editors have a big focus on diversity, and their titles represent kids from all different kinds of backgrounds, and they make a real focus on that when they're acquiring, so I'm very grateful to them. Um, those last two books at the end there, uh, The Trouble with Good Ideas and The Prettiest, are two books that I really enjoyed working on because they have Jewish main characters that aren't books about the Holocaust, um, <laughs> which growing up, my mom really really struggled to find books like that. They were very hard to find. They're still pretty hard to find. Um, but I know that it's like so important as a child to have books that represent your experience. And when you can't find them, it's very disorienting. So I'm very proud that I get to work on a lot of books that I feel are really making a difference uh, in the lives of children. So um, here's some of my lettering work. Uh, this is all just freelance or personal stuff. Um, I try and keep my lettering skills sharp and up to date because the more you can integrate the illustrations, usually I'm hiring someone to do the illustrations and then I do the lettering or the type design myself, um, which just helps to make a more cohesive and interesting cover. So I'm going to start talking about this book. It's called I Want to Be Where You Are by Christina Forrest. It's a YA rom-com, which I love working on because they're so fun. Who doesn't like to read about teens in love? Um, so this book is... Like one sentence summary, it's about a girl who's a ballerina and she's on a road trip with a boy and then they fall in love. But the trick to this book was it's all about ballet and a ballerina, but we couldn't put any ballet on the cover. Um, <laughs> this happens a lot sometimes with the books that I work on. The powers that be tell us we can't narrow it in too much. Like if it's a book about football, you can't have any football on the cover. So I knew right off the bat as I started, this is like a Pinterest board. I always start with um, the comps that the editor gives to me and then sort of pulling from different inspiration from anywhere I can find it um, with the lettering or the illustration. So for this one, I knew I wanted to do something decorative with the lettering that hinted to the ballet aspects because I obviously couldn't put any ballerina stuff on the cover. So usually while I'm working, I'll just be doodling in my sketchbook or drawing on the back of the paper. So those first two are pencil sketches that I did as I was reading and then some other options that I did. Um, I usually work either in pencil or on the iPad, but I try and keep a mix of um, traditional and digital. So these are just some of the many, many comps that I did for this book. I think I had, this is one of the first books that I worked on at Macmillan, so I was like fresh and very ready to like put as much stuff as I could out there. So these are eight, I think I probably had at least 60 like legitimately different comps. It was because it got killed twice, so it was like, okay, 10, 20, and then it got killed, and then like another 10, you'll see. Um, so these are two covers that were completely approved by everyone until they 
and got killed. <laughs> um, so <laughs> the first one, um, we went with an illustrated direction. We hired this amazing illustrator, Alex, to do this cover. Um, it got totally approved by all the different powers that needed to approve it. The, um, my art director, the editor, the publisher, the president, the sales team, marketing, publicity. I presented those people every week, getting up in front of them like this and telling them, well, I don't show them the process, but I just show them the cover. Um, it eventually got killed because they thought it was too quiet for what we wanted the book to be like, a little too contemplative. Um, so then we went back to this bottom row of sort of um, photo stock photos. We didn't do a photo shoot. Um, and then I was drawing some little <laughs> lettering things with it. And then I think the author eventually killed that one because it just like didn't feel fresh enough, didn't feel bold enough for what we wanted. So we actually went back to our original illustrator and had her come up with some new concepts. So she did these really beautiful, bold portraits. And then I did a bunch of um, like ballet shoe inspired lettering. And then obviously we ended up going with this one. <laughs> um, and then I did some more lettering because everything like wasn't really fitting from the black and white to the um, to the color, but we ended up here. And that's how we got there. Um, I also had the opportunity to design uh, Christina's second book, um, which we just got the galleys for, and I just finished designing it like, you know, two weeks ago. <laughs> um, it's not a sequel, but we did want them to look nice together on the shelf if they were shelved together. So we chose a different illustrator, obviously a very different color palette, but I kept the stacked white type as kind of an ode to I want to be where you are. So we hired a new illustrator for this one, and these were the first three sketches that we got. Um, in this book, the girl is sort of a budding movie star, and her grandma is like a famous, famous actress, and she goes missing. She's like a recluse in her home, um, and she's like, oh, I'm going to be out for a minute, and then she doesn't come back. Um, so the girl and this cute hottie over here are, <laughs> are going on a wild goose chase around New York trying to find her grandma. So um, very romantic, playful. We wanted like a cute interaction with the characters, and we thought that all the sketches we're kind of missing the mark in terms of that cute interaction. And you can see there's like some weird body, like this arm is not normal. And we didn't feel that it was <laughs> like iconic New York enough also, because we wanted like a real New York feel. So I came up with this thought of maybe you should have them in the subway instead, because that's relatable to people outside of New York, but it's also like a very classic New York place. Um, and they're in the subway and part of the book. So I couldn't find any stock photos of like cute couples in the subway because subway is a little gross. So um, I took my two editors, Kate and Brian, shout out to them. <laughs> they can't be here today, but they are now married and they were engaged to this photo shoot. Um, and so we had this little photo shoot at like 11 a.m. in the subway. Um, people were looking at us really weird. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So meanwhile, I'm still working with the type, doing different stuff. I think it, this one was a hand-drawn one, not on the iPad. But um, So this is the best part. This is the reference stock photo that we created with the actual <laughs> final cover. So they really get a big kick out of this also, because it's like from this to this. <laughs> um, yeah, so I really loved working on that one. Um, this is a book. Um, it was originally called Boy Wonder and Cat Girl. Uh, the final title changed. You'll see that later. But um, it's about a boy and a girl who go on a summer service trip to India. And they're like, well, the boy has um, been adopted. And he's trying to find his birth mother uh, in India. And the girl is recovering from a sexual assault that happened to her in her high school. So. Um, but it's set in India for most of the story, so right off the bat I knew I had a ton of visual inspiration to play with. So um, there's like a Bollywood element, I was looking at Indian um, matchbook, like old fashioned matchbooks, um, a lot of hand painted signage and like signs on the sides of the taxi cab, and then these super bold, interesting like poster designs that are just so funky. So. Um, this is the original sketch that I drew as I was reading um, the book. So we hired illustrator Christian Northeast, who is amazing. Um, and he came to us with this sketch, which wasn't really right. We knew he would get there, but we were like, this big bird is just not doing it for us. <laughs> um, it looked too middle grade. The bird, yeah, it, it was just whatever. But we went a couple of rounds. What I love about this one is kind of what Catherine was talking about before is it's one of the ones where we knew from the very beginning, this is it, this is what we want it to be. When you know, you know. Um, and that's what it ended up being, and I'm really proud of this one. 
Um, so this book is also a middle grade book. Uh, the premise is this girl it wants to be a journalist. She's obsessed also with superheroes and like Lois Lane type thing. Um, and she thinks that her next door neighbor might be a superhero. She saves her dog, but then like disappears and she's like kind of hard to get a hold of. <laughs> um, but she actually discovers that he's being trafficked um, by a woman who is like controlling him and making him do like intense work. So it's a very intense book, um, but not really or an intense topic, but not really written in an intense way. Like it is a middle grade novel. So we knew we wanted something a little literary, but also kid friendly, which is what I have to do a lot of the time. So this one actually illustrated by Deborah Lee, who's really amazing. And we love the cover so much. They hired her to do 25 full page graphic novel, like chapter opener sort of. So it's like part graphic novel, part regular novel. Um, so this is Deb. Um, usually I present like five-ish illustrators to my creative director and we narrow it down from there. So we chose Deb because she had all the things we were looking for. She was literary, she had kid appeal. Um, you could see her characters were like so sweet in their faces and the color palette was great and we could tell from her portfolio that she was a conceptual thinker and we really wanted to go with something a little conceptual for this one as opposed to just like plain characters. So. The first round of sketches that she showed us, I love also Deb because she like explains everything as she does it. You're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So um, the first one says, referencing the whitewashed bricks, Ellie's labor, playing with typography, which is disappearing with paint, hints at abuse via band-aids. So none of these we felt were exactly right because they didn't have the big kid appeal that we were looking for. Usually in middle grade, they want to see the character on it. Um, but we could tell from her notes how closely she had read the manuscript and how she understood the book and understood like what we were going for. So I sent her this hilariously bad sketch. I'm not an illustrator, but um, we knew. I was like, what if we played with the invisible aspect of the invisible boy and like there's a silhouette of a boy and the girl's disappearing. And then I pulled this um, illustration, something about like the girl sort of disappearing into the background I thought could be interesting. So... She took it and she understood what we were talking about um, and she came to us with these new comps. So this one at the bottom was the one we ended up um, going forward with. It's a biking scene. They're like like the pivotal scene in the book when they're running away um, with the boys missing reflection in the rain puddle and bits of night sky. So um, I took that and sort of drew over it and was like, well, he had to have a cape because he's like a superhero boy. But I was like, what if um, he's in the front so you can see his missing shadow and then there's a burst of a flashlight sort of illuminating on a spotlight of like, here's this boy. Um, but also we like kept going with this other one. I, I don't know why we ended up <laughs> not going with it. So then she did some color sketches for us. And then this was a sketch that we got approved at Jacket Meeting. Um, and then she took it to final art, and the only note that we had from the final art was, like, the girl looked very, like, intense bicycle and too old and womanly, so a hot tip if you're ever illustrating kids to make them look younger is to just make their heads really big, and then all of a sudden they're 12, um, <laughs> so that's what we did, <laughs> so that, and then that's how um, the final book turned out. <laughs> so I also like to do some photographic covers sometimes. This book is a book about um, a girl who has a hoarding disorder and she collects all these little objects. Um, so I source all the objects from Amazon, Duane Reed, like my friend had like as a teacher and had to give me like a school lunch carton. Um, and then my boss was nice enough to let me photograph it in my own home, in my studio. Well, it's not a studio, it's just my apartment. Um, but we have this set up and everything, so I shot this, like, standing on my couch, like, over the thing. It was, it was very hodgepodge, as I'm sure some of you can relate to. And then this is another one that I photographed that I'm really proud of. Um, it's called A High Five for Glenn Burke. It's about... Uh, another middle grade novel about a boy who is gay and he's on a baseball team and he's trying to figure out how to come out to his parents and his team and his best friend. Um, and he's also, in the meantime, doing a book report on Glenn Burke, who is a baseball player who actually invented the high five. Like, someone invented the high five and it was him. Um, but he was also gay and he ended up getting, you know, kicked out of uh, baseball because of it. 
Um, so the kid, um, I was trying to think as I was reading the book, like what would a middle school kid be doing as he's like writing his book report? And I was like, he'll be at his desk and he's putting stuff up on his wall or he's pinning things. Um, and I drew all the little like things and photographed it myself. And my favorite part about this book and this cover was that um, the author liked the idea so much that he wrote the stickers and the bulletin board into the book after <laughs> we came up with the cover. So I was really proud of that one. <laughs> Um, that's it. That's me. Some more of my covers. <laughs> Hello there. Um, thank you, Nicole and Anne, for inviting me to speak on this panel. Usually I'm sweating in the back of this room, and I'm never on this side, so this is something really new. Um, so thank you for that, this experience. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Juliana Lee, and I work as an art director at Little Brown and Company, a division of Hachette Books. So that's me, my obligatory childhood photo. This is me as a young girl in New Jersey, where I was born and bred. My parents came from Korea in the 1970s, um, seeking a better life, and they decided to settle in West Orange, New Jersey. So we were the typical hardworking immigrant family. Uh, my parents had a wholesale business on 28th Street and Broadway, and they sold sunglasses, which later then turned into uh, beaded jewelry and African jewelry and flags. And we were very popular during parade times. Um, <laughs> and here's my dad looking really cool in the 80s um, at a store. And that's me in the red dress. And, in front of my uh, dad's store. That was uh, the Korean parade. This is way before Koreans became so cool. <laughs> but um, they worked really hard. They worked seven days a week. Um, sometimes I helped them work there. So uh, just to you know, put us through college. I have two older sisters. We're all really great at art, but I think everybody here is probably good at art, so I don't think it's anything new. Because my, my sisters went to art school, my parents were like, please don't go to art school. And so then I decided to go to Barnard College instead. And I was like, I'm going to make something of myself. <laughs> and uh, I ended up you know, doing sociology and anthropology. And I, of course, then I was like, wow, I really like these fine art classes that they offer here. So I like, snuck into as many fine art classes as I could get. Um, and when I graduated, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I don't mean to age myself, but the dot-coms were this big thing. And I went to work for a dot-com, and I was really bored. I was just making polls of, like, who's the hottest guys I villagers want to know. And like, then I was like, OK, let me, let me do web design. And that's when I decided to do an associate's degree at Parsons School of Design. And while I was there, I ended up falling in love with print. And that's how I ended up being there. So. While I was uh, still a student, um, my friend gave me uh, this book to read called Perfume. And it was designed by the great Gabrielle Wilson. And I just fell in love with this cover. I was like, this is so cool. And lo and behold, Gabrielle Wilson started to teach a book cover design class at Parsons. So I was like, I'm going to take this class. This is really cool. And this was one of the assignments that I had. I had to redesign Barrel Fever. This is not stock imagery. It's for my sister's yearbook. Um, as I said, I'm from New Jersey, and this is proof. And um, Gabriella thought this was hilarious. Um, there are so many pictures in here. I could have done the whole mechanical and flaps full of just a, a background. And you know, you would think this was the 1980s, but this was actually 1991. And um, from there, I ended up meeting uh, Evan Gaffney, who became as a guest speaker, and he hired me as an assistant. Um, so for those of you who know Evan Gaffney, he's a fabulous book cover designer and designer of many things. He's really a master at the great big book look. Um, he did Bridget Jones's, Di Bridget Jones's Diary, among many others. And so I must have really frustrated him because I designed Everything I designed had really small, precious type. And it was just like, of the time, everybody just like, it was so tiny. Um, and when I would do a comp for him, he would take it from me and improve upon it so much, it would just be completely his own. 
Um, so this is my contribution. Uh, I'm, this is me on the cover of his book cover. And he said he needed, this book was about a dorky teenage girl and he asked me to pose. <laughs> and um, he asked me to bring my mother's shoes because she used to be a nurse. So he's like, yeah, bring your mother's nursing shoes. So I did that. He also told me this was for concept only. But <laughs> then it ended up that the publisher didn't want to pay for a photo shoot. So I am permanently now on this cover. <laughs> Uh, working for Evan Gaffney um, Open Doors, I was able to get some interviews with uh, publishing companies, and I got an interview with Little Brown and Company, and they offered me a junior level position, and thus I have started my 15 career at Little Brown. So it's been really great because I got to experience working on so many genres from literary fiction, nonfiction, like self help, cookbooks, thrillers, etc. But this was my very first assignment at Little Brown. This was my test that Mario Police, the creative director, gives, every, like, gives a, a freelance project. It's really a test. Um, and uh, they, I was just told that the author wanted to use this Monet painting for the cover. And I think I was still really influenced by Gabrielle Wilson's uh, design for perfume, and hence why I used all those dingbats. Some more of my early covers. Um, this is probably the last time I'm ever going to use type this small. I'm never going to be allowed to anymore, <laughs> especially now with digital thumbnails. Everything has to be huge. I don't even know how to design anymore with small type. <laughs> Another early one. Um, and this one, I feel like I really could see Evan's influence on me um, with this one here. So, okay, so as a designer there, we get to, you know, do these photo shoots, and I show you this cover, it's not because I like it, actually, it's the opposite, I think this cover is kind of ho-hum. Um, I, so the editor wanted these three women who were supposed to be sisters on the cover, and we did this photo shoot, and it, it just kind of looked a lot like what was out there at the time. And of course, it didn't sell. <laughs> so when you're in-house and things don't sell, you have to redesign it for paperback. And they didn't have any ideas. They were like, put three women on the front, on the cover again. And I was like, OK, well, that didn't work. So um, I also didn't really felt like it said what the book was about, which was about uh, labels and just how you get pigeonholed into like a role, like being the pretty one or the smart one for uh, in a family. So I was like, okay, let me just try alt type. And I did this uh, typographic solution instead, and um, they really liked it. And I was actually surprised that they went for it. Of course, then they told me, put three women on it. <laughs> so that's what I did. And, and make them all color. So I was like, okay. So it's all about compromise. I mean, you know, you put stuff in your portfolio, and sometimes it's not what you want for the final, but, you know, you know, you have to do it. <laughs> okay, so I would say that a good chunk of my time is research. I would say about 90% of the time I'm surfing the Internet just looking for things or just walking around looking for things. And so this is a really, this was a really fun book to work on. Um, it's called... The Wrong Heaven, and it's one of those like short stories, literary pieces that all the de in-house designers fight over, and then they're like, how come you got it? Why didn't I get it? And, or, and so then um, it allows you to have like more creative freedom. So as I said, we look so much um, for new art, um, and a lot of artists who have, and we want to also look for artists who haven't been discovered and never been put on a book cover before, because once they're put on a book cover, it's like game over, you can't use that again. So I managed to find this French artist named Soasig Chamelard. And um, there's a story in this book. It's like the first story is about a woman who talks to her Jesus and Mary lawn ornaments. And I found her, I was like, Wow, it's heaven sent, right? And like she's wearing mom jeans. It's so cool. And she's just, and like, just like her whole page was full of these cool things. There's like a story of a, of a woman who wants to become a horse, and there's Mary with My Little Pony. So, like, I just had 
fun things to work with here. And I was like, oh, good. I can, maybe I can use for the one um, with the lamp, like glow and dark ink. But my publisher was like, no, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so. But luckily, they went with this one. Because if I, they hadn't used this, I don't think I would ever find another cover to use this again. So this was a cover done by my colleague, Allison Warner. And they really drove her crazy with it. And she eventually left the company. Um, it, it wasn't because of this cover, although I don't think it helped, but she did, she left the company and then, you know, they were like, okay, now you work on it. So they were like, we want it to look completely different, but it must include the following. It must have Detroit 1970s type picture of Fanny Davis, lorry numbers, retro telephone shoes. And I was like, oh, so you basically want the hardcover again. I'm like, no, no, we want it brand new. Make it simple, please. And I was like, all right. So, you know, sometimes you just got to do what they ask for. <laughs> so I was like, okay, here, I hit all the points. Lottery numbers. Phone. Fanny Davis. 70s type. Uh, what else? Lo what did I say? Lottery numbers. Uh, and I, I, I was like, I'm not doing the shoes. That's just, that's just too much. <laughs> so... So then that's eventually what became the final. And then they were like, let's do a tip-in. And then we could put the lottery numbers there and other stuff. I was like, oh, OK, now you tell me that there was going to be a tip-in. And we could have extended that other stuff. But this is just what we do in-house. <coughs> this is another thing that I did. Uh, this is uh, written by Steve Ruchin, who is a writer for Sports Illustrated. And he was writing about his memoir of growing up in the 1970s in the suburbs of America. And um, it started off with Stingray Afternoons. And it's clearly, I had to, if it's Stingray Afternoons, I had to put a Stingray bike on it. But we, this is, this, as designers, we have to look at different time eras and just like design elements to evoke that period. So then when the next book came out called Nights in White Castle, it was, I was like, OK, now I got to do 80s. And it was, this was actually really fun because it has White Castle in the title. I mean, <laughs> I was like, I have to use black letter type for this. And it just so happens that it's also a nod to the heavy metal days of the 1980s. And it, you know, my publisher was like, we can't use that type. We can't use a White Castle font. And I was like, this is not the White Castle font. It's just like evokes it. But it was my job that I was successful in um, evoking that. This is California. Um, this book is about a dystopian future in California. And that's all I know about it, because I didn't read it. Um, <laughs> I didn't have to read it. It was originally going to be used as the book cover of another book. Well, I had it as a comp as another book called The Three. And the editor liked this one so much, she was like, oh, can we use it for this book, California? Because we have no idea what to do for it. I think it would be perfect. So I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. And little did I know that we would get into sort of a Little Brown um, got into, actually not Little Brown, sorry, Hachette got into an Amazon price war. And so Stephen Colbert was like, I'm going to showcase some of these books. And he showcased California. And then it got huge. It was like all over the press. And it, nobody thought anybody would probably really pick up this book. So it was really embarrassing, because I think BuzzFeed asked me to write an article about my process. And I was like, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, this never happens. I, I like, literally, that's what I have to say in the article. So now there's many hats that we wear. This is my life as an art director. So Little Brown is really weird. Um, you get an art director job, like, assignment like right when you start and you're like I don't know how to do this so that's what happened to me and they were like my creative director Mara Pilici is like oh can you work on this Julia and Julia paper bag which is a rather large book and I was like okay you know and so he they wanted to hire Mara Kalman and I contacted her and she never answered me back and I was like, OK, so what do I do? So I started looking for illustrators. I was like, oh, OK, she, this woman could be a Mara Kalman. And so she did this art, and it just wasn't really working out. I was like, this doesn't look like right. It doesn't look, for Mara Cal it doesn't look like Mara Kalman. And when I tried to put in a layout, the editor kept saying, oh, it just looks too young. It doesn't look sophisticated. And I didn't know what to do, because I really tried with her, with the illustrator, to 
get her to do more, but she just couldn't do it. So I was sweating. I was like, what do I do? So I zoomed in on the art. I was like, okay, <laughs> let me zoom in. And then I took my left hand, and I was like, okay, let me do hand lettering. So I took my left hand so it would be quirky, and that's <laughs> what you see here. And it was actually really embarrassing because then the illustrator contacted me, and she's like, my handwriting looks so great. And I didn't really have the heart to tell her that it was actually mine. So I just heard things like, sure, it's yours. But I managed to save the art. Um, but that's when I'm, it's, uh, being an art director or just art directing is, is an art in itself. You really n have to know how to choose the right people, how to collaborate, how to talk to people um, to get your point across, and especially not piss people off, because I did piss people off. I hired a really famous octogenarian illustrator once, and I told him to make revisions. And this was just the second round of revisions. I was like, my publisher wants you to make these revisions. And his, this was his email response to me. I'll read it to you. Dear Juliana, <laughs> your email response indicates, sadly, that we have likely reached the end of the road. The reason you asked me to do this job in the first place has to do it, I assume, with a 60-year-plus career where I achieved a certain reputation, mostly because I had fun at my job. I learned to have fun at my job oh so many years ago by no longer listening to the comments of art directors and the others who sought to improve my work to such a degree that I could no longer stand looking at it. That seems to bear, be where we are now. I am sorry it hasn't worked out. I could have used the X amount of dollars, but not at the expense of my own pride in my work. Best regards, famous illustrator. <laughs> this is actually, this guy's my hero. I mean, when I got this, I was like, this is the best letter I've ever received in my life. I mean, I was like, I wish I didn't get it, but at the same time, this is amazing. I'm going to send it to everybody. I think everybody, when I go down to flames, this is what I'm going to send to everybody. So, um, <laughs> so this is, um, I did get to do some big photo shoots. Um, this one was for Tabloid City uh, at the time. Mad Men was wildly popular. And so I got the green light. They were like, let's do it like a Mad Men scene. And I got to hire Scott Nobles, who did a lot of photography for Grand Central as well. And um, we ha I got to pick models. It was very exciting. I got to pick models. And we got like a license to shoot in uh, Wall Street area. And we wanted people to walk through. But everybody was really shy. So we were just like kind of waiting around. For, so these are the brave souls who were so oblivious that they walked in on the shot and we composited it in. But I'm, the reason why I show you this is because this is not really happening anymore. We don't do these big budget photo shoots so, because we usually only reserve those for celebrities. Um, but this is one of the last ones I got to do at the time. Speaking of... TV celebrities. This is Chris Kimball. I'm not sure if you are aware of who he is. He it was on. He is on PBS. He used to be in America's Test Kitchen, and he um, branched off and started his own show called uh, The Milk Street. So we got we acquired his books, and this is kind of like. We have his design team. I have to work with his design team who are design have their input, then Chris has an input, and then ours. So there's just a lot of cooks right now. So when we were doing his first book, as you can see, that the like they what sales really wanted, which is a big picture of Chris, like you know, Jacques Pepin and Ina Garden. And then what Chris wanted was something really abstract. He's like, I don't want to be on the cover. I want, you know, really like arty cookbook for a coffee table or something like that. And sales is like, no way. So it was just like went back and forth. And I was like, OK, what am I going to do? <laughs> so Chris Kimball is uh, known for his vodka pie crust recipe. And this was my way of sort of marrying the two. Uh, he agreed to be on it um, in this way, where uh, you can't see, but this is a center die cut. And on paper overboard, and there is foil on the pie crust shape. So he was happy because he got his little like minimalist cook looking cookbook, and sales was happy because they got Chris on it. Now this book, Less, was a real joy to do. I loved when I read this. I was like, this is such a great book, and it's very rare when you get an author who just 
knows like which illustrations would work for his book. And uh, Anderson Greer really uh, like pays attention to New Yorker illustrators, and he gave a whole suggestion. And one of them was Leo Espinosa. And I saw his work. I read this story. I don't know if you read less, but um, there's the main character is like a failed writer. And when I saw this picture, I was like, this is perfect. Uh, I contact Leah Espinosa. I made him, the character look more like Les uh, in the book. I, you know, he has a signature suit he wears. I made him younger, blonde hair. And this went by really easily. It's like one and done. And nobody at work expected this to be a Pulitzer, like even considered for a Pulitzer Prize. And I remember sitting at the doctor's office and Greg Kulik texted me and he was like, oh my gosh, Les won the Pulitzer. And I was like, Greg, you're such a jerk, you know? <laughs> this is not funny, that's really mean. And he's like, no, I really did. And I was like, wow. And uh, you know, had they known it was gonna win, they would have tortured me for it. Um, and if we do any more books with Anshan Greer, I know, like, I don't want it because they're going to torture me. <laughs> it's going to go on and on because there's so much expectations on it. I'm just joking. I really do want it, but they will torture me on it. Okay, so now life as a freelancer, we all do it. We all moonlight as freelancers. At our, you know, it's good, it's good extra cash. So... Uh, you get a lot of creative freedom as a freelancer because um, you don't hear the conversations that go on, so you don't know if some off, some like editor really hates to use black or you know what I mean. So you just kind of just do what you do, and I get a lot of domestic suspense. So this is some of the domestic suspense, and I really actually enjoy doing these. These are a lot of fun to do. Um, the main challenge though is just to keep it look looking fresh because this is such a saturated market. So here is uh, the final of one that I did from Roseanne Sarah, who is the art director. And this is, like this one went through a lot. I, this is just some of, I didn't want to give all the killed comps for this, but I mean, you just end up sometimes like, like just doing it over and over and over again, just to, there's only so many beautiful women that you could put on, on a cover. So, and you have to make it look, you know, not, horror, but still pretty enough, and of that genre. So, I mean, I was going crazy at this. So you could have given me a picture of anything, and I would have been like, yeah, let, let, let's try it. So, and now I'm American Dirt. <laughs> this one, um, my, my ex-coworker, Keith Hayes, called me, and he was like, I'm in a real bind here. I really need you to work on this uh, book. It's a big book. We can't solve it. You're really good at this, do what you do. <laughs> and you have a week to do it. So I was like, okay, sure. So I, I read the book. I thought it was a great commercial read. I was like, wow, this is really, I could see why this is gonna be a big book. I usually what I do is I go on Pinterest and I collect a lot of uh, imagery in my head just to sort of work with. And I knew that this book had to be emotive and political, but it couldn't veer too heavily political looking because then it could look like nonfiction. And, you know, he, Keith was like, make it look pretty, Jules, make it look pretty, and, and make it like a, like a woman read it. So I was like, oh, okay. And <laughs> Mexico is, you know, has such a rich visual history. There was a ton of things I could have pulled from, but I, I needed to get something that's, show that somebody was restricted and uh, and not getting their freedom and when I saw these Mexican tiles I was like oh okay let me try it with barbed wire and lo and behold it worked and the rest is history I, I don't really have to go into this right now <laughs> I'm sure I'll uh, you can ask me questions later this is a book that's right now on the best the bestseller list. This, when I say that we don't hear conversations in, uh, in that goes in house, this is a, a case. I got this assignment from Christopher Lynn, and he's like, "Just make it look fun, and um, we don't know what we're we don't know what they want." So I went with a very photographic approach for this one. These are just some of them ones that I did, but. Uh, the, these were all killed, and I didn't know why, 
but I saw the final, which was really, it's really nice. It's um, an illustration and of like fishes and it's, it's a, like, I, it's a pattern and I could see why they would use that. And it's one of those things that just happens with when you freelance, it gets killed, no hard feelings, you move on to the next project. Have you seen, like, I do a lot of, I don't know why I get a lot of stories about mothers, and I think it's because I have these little two here. While at work, they have a nanny, and I think that's why Roseanne Sarah gave me this assignment about a killer nanny. <laughs> and she, so she really messed with my head in this one. It's actually inspired by true events um, where a couple years ago, a nanny uh, killed her two children that she was looking after. And they were like the same age as my kids. So when Roseanne gave me this, I was like, this is really messed up. OK. <laughs> I don't make my nanny wear a uniform, by the way. It just so happens. It's in the book. This is a case where the, this was done in-house, and they couldn't nail it. And I think the reason why was because it was originally called Lullaby. It was a French book, and then they translated it into it for the a North American market. It was called Lullaby, and I just so happened to get this project right when it, they changed it to the perfect nanny. Um, and that made my, my, my job so much, more, so much easier. I, it's, I don't know if editors are aware of this, but uh, the title can be very, it could be limiting, it could be very suggestive. Uh, it really matters if you have a good title and that helps you create a really, a really nice cover or you know, not, it could be so limiting. So I think that I got very lucky when it, it's, it's a little bit of a sensational title, but it really works. That's it. So thank you very much. Thank you.